Okay, hello everyone and thank you for joining. I'm Becca Dezombek from the Media Relations Office and we're going to get started. I'd like to welcome to you to this press briefing this afternoon titled Why We Need to Go Carbon Negative and How We Can Get There. We will begin with each panelist giving brief presentations describing their work and then we'll open it up to questions from the reporters. We will end on the hour or when there are no more questions, whichever comes first. Reporters, because this is a Zoom webinar, you won't be able to unmute yourselves or turn on your video. Uh, so if you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you please put your full name and affiliation into the Q&A box, not the chat box, but the Q&A box. And we will request that you unmute yourself to ask your question in the order that they were received. Uh, if you'd rather ask your question via text and not speak, you can do that just by, in addition to typing your full name and affiliation, ask your question in the Q&A box and Liza will pose it to the panel on your behalf. You can write in a question at any time, but please note that we won't actually ask it to the panelists until the Q&A session when the panelists have completed their presentations. Uh, reporters, please also make sure that your name is accurate uh, in Zoom so that we can find you quickly in the participant list and unmute you. The slides and other additional materials related to this briefing will be posted to the Press Information Exchange on AGU Connect, and we'll drop a link to that in the chat. This event is being recorded and the recording will be posted to AGU's YouTube channel and the link will be shared to that in the press information exchange as well. Uh, please bear with us should any technical issues arise. Uh, if Zoom webinar does go down for some reason, we'll switch to presenting this uh, briefing through a teleconference line. And if that happens, we'll just email everyone immediately with instructions on how to gain access to that teleconference line. Uh, otherwise, if you experience technical issues during this uh, press event, please do just email news at agu.org. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to our panelists today. Great, thank you so much. Hi everyone, I'm Noah Deitch. I'm the president and co-founder at Carbon 180 which is a nonprofit organization that's now based in Washington, DC, but got our start at UC Berkeley about six years ago. We focus on essentially connecting the innovation landscape on carbon removal to the policy conversation. And the last time that I was at AGU to give a presentation was, was five years ago. And in preparation for, for this talk, I just had a chance to go review the slides as well as the attendee list from the, the session that we gave. And I think the thing that struck me more than anything is how different the conversation on carbon removal is today than five short years ago. And so what I would like to share is that broader context and hopefully tee it up for where each of our other panelists has more technical detail on some of the, the promising solution pathways that we have today. So on the next slide, what I wanna start with is just a definition slide. What do we mean when we say carbon removal? We think about carbon removal pretty broadly as any solution that can capture CO2 that has already been emitted into the atmosphere and pull it back out of the atmosphere and keep it there for a, a long enough time period that it is no longer re-entering the atmosphere. Historically, this looked like a lot of land-based solutions, the photosynthetic pathways, including planting trees and farming in ways that sequester carbon in soil, to some more technology-heavy pathways, figuring out how to separate CO2 from the air and store it underground or in our built environment through essentially chemical engineering. Um, on the, the next slide, I will note that there is now an expansion of the detail on both terrestrial as well as ocean-based carbon removal pathways. The National Academies has released two studies on this in the past four years. Um, the most recent one came out last week, I believe, on the ocean pathways. Uh, these reports have an immense amount of technical detail and can help provide a, a much greater level of um, technical overview depending on if there are specific pathways that are of interest to anyone. One thing I will note is that when we talk about carbon removal, 
it overlaps with, but is distinct from emission reductions. Carbon capture and storage for fossil energy is related to, but distinct from direct air capture and storage, for example. So is forest conservation distinct from forest restoration. At the end of the day, when it comes to developing these solutions, it's almost impossible to disentangle them. But when we talk about the characteristics of each of these solutions and how we think about it, it is important to do that disambiguation. So next slide, please. I think the thing that I want to share, and if you take nothing else away with this from this, this conversation, is how far ahead the carbon removal policy conversation is today than it was just a few short years ago. There's now billions of dollars of federal support for both innovation work as well as demonstration of novel technologies, as well as a huge amount of interest in figuring out how to unlock that corporate interest that we've seen as companies around the world, as governments have said that they are going to get to net zero emissions. The net piece of that almost always assumes some amount of carbon removal and helping to disentangle what that is has been a, a really key piece of the conversation in, in recent years. This support calls into surface just an immense amount of new research that the research community has both more questions to answer as well as less time to answer the questions well. Policymakers are looking to inform where they spend money, how they account for uh, the carbon benefits of various solutions and are looking to put these into practice today. So I, I think it's of utmost imperative that we both elevate and scale the work that is doing, that we are doing as a community across all of the different carbon removal solutions because it is now more applied than it has ever been. Uh, next slide, please. I think one of the, the most exciting announcements in the past couple of, of months that I've seen is the Department of Energy here in the, the US announced a carbon negative earth shot. This is the first time that the DOE has explicitly announced a carbon removal funding initiative. And I believe it's the first across the entire US government to, there certainly has been funding for carbon removal in the past, but never a full scale program. This carbon negative earth shot is modeled much like the Sunshot program of about a decade ago, where a very ambitious goal was set and the funding was coordinated across a number of different buckets to achieve this goal. I think for a lot of the innovation that we are seeing, DOE is, is incorporating research in a very smart way. They are including the entire portfolio of carbon removal solutions in their efforts and are really being very aggressive on, on costs. Right now, many carbon removal solutions cost hundreds, if not thousands of dollars a ton, $100 a ton or less with really robust carbon accounting and permanence and additionality will be something that would be a game changer for the field and one that DOE and the rest of the academic community thinks is entirely plausible with sufficient funding over the next decade. Uh, next slide, please. Backing up this ambitious goal is ambitious funding levels. I think the two biggest numbers here are the three and a half billion dollars that is now in law for direct air capture and storage hubs in the US, which in the next five years, DOE now has to spend this money to generate four different direct air capture and storage hubs of million ton scale or greater. Compare that to the several thousand ton per year direct air capture and storage project in Iceland that is commercially operating as a joint venture between Climeworks and CarbFix. This is several orders of magnitude larger than where the field is. Granted, it's still several orders of magnitude smaller than what we'll need for climate eventually, 
but the field is just accelerating rapidly and there will be a new commercial imperative for work on things like direct air capture and storage, especially if the budget deal passes through the Senate. There is an increase in the tax credit for direct air capture and storage to $180 a ton. If that goes through, again, it will be enough for kind of first of a kind projects, but it's something that is attracting the interest of investors, large companies, as well as the incumbent startups that are, are working in this space um, alike. So it's, it's a very interesting time and we're very much at an inflection point when it comes to commercial maturity. And, and this is just one solution within a broad portfolio of carbon removal options. Um, next slide, please. The other thing that we are seeing is a real increase in funding for conservation programs. I think a big challenge that we have seen is the carbon accounting associated with nature-based solutions has struggled to prove the additionality and permanence that some of the technological-based solutions, which albeit cost way more, are able to demonstrate much more easily. I think as a result, we've seen a shift in funding away from paying for performance today to paying for practices and really getting the practices on the ground so that we can then do the research necessary to improve the accounting. That $8 billion figure for ag climate research, I think represents not just a number, but a commitment across the US government to really coordinate and scale a lot of the work that has been done historically and needs to be done in order to understand everything from kind of the basic soil biogeochemistry to the specific technology integration of the big data that will emerge from connected sensors, satellite imaging, um, even things like drone-based LIDAR that can be used to, to measure soil carbon. Um, next slide, please. Oh, looks like we have a, a duplicate here. The carbon negative risk shot is important. Um, I guess it's always good to reiterate that. But then I, I think in, in wrapping up here, the other key piece of this equation is private sector action, as I've talked about. Um, we now see a handful of tech companies that are incredibly well capitalized, have ambitious climate goals, are really moving what it means to offset emissions by paying a lot for carbon removal. Stripe, for example, has publicly stated that they are paying $200 to $2,000 a ton for technological carbon removal with the explicit aim of driving down the price. Microsoft has also said that they are looking for carbon removal, but given their constraints as a public company about how much they can pay per ton, they're almost exclusively doing nature-based carbon removal, even though that they would like to, in the future, increase the fraction of um, technological removal. Um, next slide, please. And so I think the key thing here is that we are starting to see companies buy carbon removal, but without a clear standard. There is no voluntary carbon market. There are plenty of voluntary carbon markets. There are bilateral deals. And it's just a very messy ecosystem right now in which there is not standard definitions about what carbon removal even is let alone how to account for that across these different schemes. Uh, one of the things that our organization is working on right now is figuring out how the federal government can help standardize that, both through its procurement of carbon removal, as well as through helping to define some of those standards um, and invest in the technology innovation that can make a broader portfolio of solutions affordable to more companies. Uh, next slide, please. The last thing I'll say is that the research here needs to move forward a lot more, not just on the hard sciences side, but on the social science piece as well. There's been huge interest that we've seen from environmental justice groups, labor unions, and environmental nonprofits on the social dimensions of carbon removal, 
at the end of the day, there is no natural market for this. This is something where policymakers are going to have to say on behalf of the people, we want to clean up carbon removal or clean up carbon from our atmosphere, and we will fundamentally have to pay for carbon removal. Figuring out how to do that is going to require political will and figuring out how to deploy projects in a way that really benefit communities and happen in places where communities want is a key piece of the political conversation today and is often not as connected to the, the academic conversation as would be beneficial. Um, next slide, please. That's all I have time for today, but I can ever help with, with other questions or if there are different pieces of this um, that would be helpful, please feel free to reach out to me and any of my colleagues at Carter 180. So without further ado, I will say thank you and turn it over to, to my friend, Bill, to, to take us away. Thank you so much, Noah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bill Collins. I'm the Director for Climate and Ecological Sciences at Berkeley Laboratory and also a professor in Earth and Planetary Sciences at the University of California, Berkeley. And what I'd like to do today is describe to you a new initiative that we've launched to follow up on the vision that Noah has just laid out for us called the Carbon Negative Initiative. And this uh, will sort of set the stage for why we think this is an urgent initiative to undertake uh, right now. Next slide, please. So in August of this year, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its latest assessment, the sixth assessment of climate change, uh, sort of the physical sciences behind that. And a number of my colleagues and I served as lead authors in that report. The core messages from the IPCC, which I, I won't read, but are listed here, really uh, emphasize how critical it is that we understand that climate change is occurring right now that the carbon dioxide that we've released from fossil fuel combustion is responsible for a great deal of that climate change. And then in order to halt further climate change, we're going to have to make very rapid and sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. Those, uh, those emission reductions have to occur quickly. Uh, we've sort of run out of runway to kick the can down the road. Under uh, current emissions trajectories, we will exceed the amount of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, which will keep the climate less than one and a half degrees centigrade, warmer than pre-industrial times, in about another 18 years. Uh, and at that point, the climate will be uh, sufficiently hotter that our ability to predict how it will respond uh, begins become less and less accurate. We do. However, expect that those changes will be large uh, and in many cases undesirable. And this uh, scenario is laid out in another report from the IPCC called the Global Warming of One and a Half Degrees Celsius that's released three years ago. Next slide. So in order to uh, reverse the emissions of greenhouse gases, we've been thinking about this in terms of mitigating emissions. And that's shown in this slide where we uh, it's a time series of uh, the emissions of greenhouse gases uh, in terms of billions of tons of carbon dioxide per year running out to the end of the century. We've been thinking about this in just in terms of mitigating emissions, but that's no longer sufficient. Um, we are going to have to, uh, please, uh, next slide, please. We're actually going to have to attain negative emissions, as Noah is describing. Uh, and now click four times, please. Thank you, stop. Um, and those negative emissions will be accomplished by capturing CO2, uh, enhancing the, the natural sinks of carbon dioxide on land, transporting the CO2 that we capture, storing it in geological formations, and we'll be hearing about that a little bit later today. Ideally, transforming some of that carbon dioxide into useful byproducts, for example, uh, biofuels for um, air transit. We will need to track where the CO2 is going. And of course, as Noah described, we have to launch a new global industry uh, and that's gonna require scaling it. Next slide. So we've launched an initiative that's aimed at the grand challenges and NETS, and that stands for negative emission technologies. What we're aiming to do is to identify and demonstrate new negative emission technologies. The ones that we have were designed for legacy applications, things like essentially uh, removing 
carbon dioxide from the flues of coal fired power plants, we now have to remove carbon dioxide that's literally free in the environment. And that will require a whole new set of technologies. We need to find pathways to accelerate and optimize existing negative emission technologies. Uh, and third, we will need to integrate this all into a new system, literally a new global industry that's designed to basically take the fossil fuel industry and run it through a mirror, <laughs> run it backwards, if you will, to instead of putting carbon dioxide into the environment to remove it at scale. And that's going to be a very large challenge. Next slide. So you will hear a number of my colleagues present some of the exciting science that underlies this challenge going forward. Uh, we are, to be honest with you, at the very early stage of deploying carbon dioxide removal at scale. Uh, fortunately, some of the most promising technologies have already been intensively researched, and we're getting ready to now see if we can scale those up to the point where they become globally relevant. We're gonna hear from three colleagues on promising solutions using natural systems and geological storage coming up next. And we also have a colleague standing by to answer your questions about direct air capture and biological solutions. And with that, um, let me, uh, uh, in my part of this presentation, next slide. And if you would like to hear further, um, you're welcome to contact media at lbl.gov. And let me turn the floor over now to my three colleagues. Thank you. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Wendy Silver, and I am going to talk to you about climate change mitigation on working lands. As Bill said, this is a uh, this generally falls under the category of natural climate solutions, although what we're talking about here is not expecting nature to do it itself, but look at ways in which we can manage landscapes, particularly agricultural landscapes, to enhance carbon capture and storage. So next slide. And particularly what I want to focus on is soil carbon sequestration, and there's a lot of reason for that. Uh, one reason is, is that it's a very large potential carbon sink, carbon storage pool, uh, about 3,000 gigatons of carbon or more. We don't know exactly. You can think of it as a big brown box that's very hard to quantify exactly. But what's key here is that the soil holds considerably more carbon than the atmosphere. And we know that management has resulted in, land management has resulted in the loss of carbon from soils. And we also know that improved management can increase the carbon storage in soils. Next slide, please. Uh, there are several ways in which management can increase soil carbon sequestration. Uh, these are approaches that have been uh, well quantified. One of those is uh, through biochar amendments. Biochar amendments have been estimated uh, as a technical potential to be able to sequester about four gigatons of CO2 equivalent at a global scale. And then improved land management in croplands and rangelands, activities like uh, reduced tillage or improved grazing can sequester another 3.3. And again, these are uh, techniques that have been uh, researched and tested at a global scale. And of course, there's a lot more to know about them. And, and a, a lot more to understand, but our preliminary estimates suggest that the combined potential of these approaches is about seven gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year. And if you think about what Bill just said about needing to remove 10 to 20 gigatons per year, this is certainly significant and should be part of any portfolio. Next slide, please. Uh -oh. Hello, can you guys hear me? Uh -oh. Hello, can you guys hear me? Uh oh, there it goes. Okay, um, theoretically improved soil management could sequester enough carbon to reduce temperatures by up to 0.3 degrees Celsius by 2100 with, uh, when combined with aggressive emissions reduction. And this last piece is really important, right? We've heard from the other speakers that you really need to reduce carbon emissions to realize the benefit from carbon dioxide removal. Uh, but the models suggest that if we could technically remove seven gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year, 
we would be able to lower temperatures by around 0.3 degrees Celsius by 2100. And again, this is aspirational, but even if we can get half of that way, it has a significant impact on climate if our goal is to stay within 1.5 degrees Celsius. Next slide, please. Soil amendments have received a lot of attention in working lands as potential carbon dioxide removal strategies and soil carbon sequestration strategies. And one of the most promising is compost amendments. The estimated global potential of compost is about two gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year. That's just the direct capture by applying compost as a slow release fertilizer that then increases uh, plant growth and, and uh, stores that carbon in the soil. Uh, there's also uh, a lot of indirect potential that hasn't been quantified, like lowering emissions from waste streams uh, such as landfills and slurry ponds um, and putting that waste into a lower emitting compost system that uh, can save particularly methane emissions. I've already mentioned biochar has tremendous potential. And then one that you're going to hear about shortly is ground rock amendments to working lands that can sequester inorganic carbon and the global potential that's estimated for carbon capture is about two gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year as both direct and indirect capture. Next slide. Uh, compost amendments uh, have been tested are, and are beginning to be tested more broadly, but have been tested in California. We've done experiments across the state. The preliminary results of that were very exciting. Uh, results suggested that compost amendments could sequester between about five and seven metric tons of CO2 equivalent per hectare. Next slide. And when we think about that in the context of land area, this was in uh, this, the compost was applied to rangelands. If we take just half the rangeland area in California and half of the measured rate, assuming that we might not reach the measured rate um, everywhere we would sequester 21 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year. Uh, if we reached the measure rate, it would be 42 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year that would be saved in soils. Um, and I've just put some emission sources for comparison uh, to give you an idea of how significant this could be uh, if uh, scaled out to a state level just in the state of California. Um, and you may be thinking about, well, how scalable is this? But most ranchers and farmers know that increasing soil organic matter content uh, is a benefit. It, it increases the uh, nutrient availability and thus increases plant growth. It increases the water holding capacity and is thus a, a insurance against drought and it decreases erosion. So there's not a lot of work that needs to be done to convince farmers and ranchers to do this. Um, and there's a lot of activity at the state level and at the national level now to uh, scale this out through uh, NRCS, USDA, and other uh, uh, agencies to um, make this happen. So I will stop there. I do want to mention that I will be at AGU later today. I'm uh, right now in the Dallas airport, and I'd be happy to talk with people if they have questions. Thank you. Okay, hello. Um, so uh, my name is Tom. I'm currently a scientist at Berkeley Lab. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here today and talk about how can enhanced rock weathering as soil amendments help store and capture carbon. Next slide, please. The rock weathering is a natural process that is taking up about 1 billion tons of CO2 per year. If we accelerate this process by uh, grounding the rocks and thus creating more surface area and spreading the ground rocks, we may be able to sequester more CO2 via this natural process. And the captured CO2 will end up being in the solution as bicarbonate primarily and increasing alkalinity of waters, which will help address ocean acidification. Or the captured CO2 can also be bind into carbonate minerals and stored in the solid form, which is more permanent. Next slide, please. Current estimates show that applying ground rocks in agricultural lands can sequester up to 2 billion tons of CO2 per year, as also mentioned by Wendy. This approach has a series of um, benefits. It takes advantage of soil chemistry, plant microbial interactions um, to accelerate the weathering reactions. And this is not competing with other land uses either. 
This could also have co-benefits for soil health, for example, by reducing soil acidity, which uh, so far has been achieved by the practice of liming. It, it can also uh, improve plant growth by releasing and providing more macro and micronutrients. However, there are still a lot of scientific unknowns. For example, what are the realistic achievable weathering rates? This will depend on the complex interactions of the applied rock materials, the soil matrix, and also the microbes and plant roots in the soil matrix. This will also determine how much CO2 we can actually capture and store and therefore get credit for. Also, what are the energy requirements? This will control the net CO2 captured. And how to optimize our operations is another key unknown that we need to uh, address in order to actually implement this technology. Uh, next slide, please. So to resolve those scientific unknowns mentioned in the previous slide and be able to assess the techno, uh, technical and economic feasibility of this technology, we need investigations and projections of realistic situational behavior of enhanced rock weathering as soil amendments at scale. And research in this field has really seen a big growth in the past couple of years, especially on fundamental processes, field tests, and techno-economic analysis. And at Berkeley Lab, our work is really connecting all of these four components. We're running comparative experiments using a unique smart soil test bed, which provides key information to bridge laboratory studies and field studies. And our high fidelity models uh, allow us to simulate across temporal and spatial scales uh, so that we can uh, inform the design and also project outcomes of field demonstrations. And the experimental observations and our modeling uh, results are also serving as key inputs into our techno-economic analysis and life cycle assessment. Next slide, please. Here I'm showing some preliminary modeling results. Uh, it really highlights that the weathering rate is going to be site specific. In this case uh, simulated, we're seeing higher uh, weathering rate in well-drained soils with lower infiltration rates because these conditions allow better connectivity and also accessibility of atmospheric CO2 for the weathering rea reactions. Next, please. Our modeling results also show that inc the increase in specific surface area by reducing the grain size would result in disproportionate increase in weather rate. For example, increasing the surface area from one to 10 meter square per gram, which roughly maps to one order of magnitude a reduction in the grain size, results in weather rate increase by a factor of two. And similar extent of increase can be achieved by choosing a different application site. So this means that the decision will depend on the energy cost of grounding ro the rocks and the application costs at different uh, sites. Well, these results are dependent on the assumptions of our models, which are being tested by our experimental work. They highlight that uh, the technical and economic uh, realistic achievable weathering rate will be site specific. And our model here provides a useful tool that will allow site specific optimization and design. Next slide, please. So um, to wrap up, Enhanced rock weathering as soil amendments is a promising technology to help achieve carbon neutrality goals. Uh, it can sequester up to 2 billion tons of CO2 per year, as mentioned earlier. And the recent research is really moving us forward to optimize and scale this technology, for example, by combining mechanistic understanding, carbon accounting, and cost estimate as in our work, we are setting ourselves up for site-specific optimized operations. So with that, I will end my presentation and be happy to take any questions later. Thank you. Hey there, uh, and my name is Jens Berkholzer. I'm a hydrogeologist at Berkeley Lab. And I'd like to talk to you a bit about uh, geologic carbon storage as an important technology to get to carbon negative and net zero. We'll focus particularly on issues uh, involved in scaling up this technology. Next slide. 
physiologic calm sequestration or GCS, as we sometimes say, involves taking CO2 captured from point or diffuse sources at the surface and then injecting it in pressurized form, it almost like a liquid into deep subsurface formation, as you can see here in this graphic um, for long-term storage. Now, since the pressurized CO2 is still mildly buoyant, the storage reservoirs in the deep subsurface need low permeability confining units above them, so the CO2 stays in place and it's effectively trapped. Injection is usually done very deep, at least 800 meters and often thousands of meters. So for increased storage safety, there are often multiple confining units between the storage reservoirs and the surface, and there are other trapping mechanisms in place as well in addition to these structures. Next slide. So let's step back a bit and um, just look at the image to the left, which was earlier shown by my colleague, Bill Collins. I think it's important to really um, figure out how massive these amounts are of avoided emissions per year, as well as the negative emissions or the active removals from the atmosphere. Carbon capture and geologic storage has a role to play here in several ways, and these are shown on the right. And these are not necessarily related to providing a social license for the hydrocarbon industry to continue. For example, at the top, even in a world with most renewable power and electrification, there is a need for firm, always available power. Natural gas power plants with CCS are one of the few options here. There are also important industrial sectors that emit a lot of CO2, such as cement industry or steel industry or the production of hydrogen. And unless we find alternative production methods, carbon capture and sequestration in the subsurface are the only options for decarbonizing. And then talking about negative emissions, two of the most prominent technologies for achieving those require geological storage. Uh, direct air capture, for example, as well as biomass used for power fuel production. Next slide. So let's talk about scale a little bit. Here, based on credible scenario assessment for net zero future by the Global CCS Institute uh, on the right. Um, today, we have worldwide about 40 million tons of CO2 captured and stored in the subsurface. By 2050, we will need worldwide 5,635 million tons or 5.6 gigatons, which is an increase by a factor of 150. Next slide. Here's a world map with existing and planned large scale projects. Um, today, we have 26 such projects. Each are gigantic operation of injecting several hundred thousands to million tons of CO2 per year. And so far, each have been operating safely and environmentally sound without any issue of CO2 escaping its designated storage. So CO2 injection storage is done safely, but not nearly at the scale needed. By 2050, we may have thousands of such projects and will literally fill this world map with red dots. Um, we will have geologic basins with multiple injection sites and that will store CO2 from a variety of sources. And we call these carbon hub storage hubs. Also, we have an infrastructure law in the US that provides $2.5 billion for the next five years for geologic storage commercialization. So we really better get going and capture this momentum. Next slide. So scientists like myself and my colleagues at Berkeley and elsewhere are going into overdrive right now to remove any technical remaining hurdles and challenges to go to safe CO2 storage at gigaton scale. At WNL, we call this a science to hubs initiative. And we see three major areas to pursue here at this lab. On the left, um, we show that we still need to conduct fundamental science of rock fluid systems and reactivity to understand long-term trapping for increased safety and to address concerns and costs of long-term liability. We also would like to uh, enable CO2 sequestration in unconventional rocks uh, with, with uh, out sort of structural seals, let's say large basalt domes um, with reactivity trapping and mineral trapping where other solutions do not exist. And in the center, you can see that we're working very hard on developing improved sensing methods for high resolution monitoring of CO2 in a deep subsurface, both to understand migration and also to understand leakage 
This is for verification of storage permanence. It's also for accounting of CO2 for carbon credits. And then finally to the right, given the unprecedented volumes of fluid injection, we need new approaches to optimize storage hubs with multiple storage sites and large geologic basins that interfere with each other possibly and where issues related to reservoir pressures and geomechanical damage and induced seismicity really need to be avoided. Next slide. So finally, I just wanted to give a short example of some really cool science we're doing and kind of accommodating the science geek in me. Um, I mentioned the issue of induced seismicity earlier, which refers to the possibility of reactivating faults and generating earthquakes by injecting fluids into the subsurface. At LBNL, we recently conducted a series of experiments where we injected in a controlled manner directly into a fault. This was done in an underground research lab in Switzerland. And we employed multiple cool monitoring approaches to be able to measure the stress changes and fault movement and fault migration all at the same time. And such underground tests, of course, will help us develop better predictive models for these fault reactivation processes. And in turn, these will allow management of storage projects in a manner that can avoid induced seismicity and other environmental concerns. With that all in, thank you, and we're ready for your questions. All right, thank you to all our panelists. We'll get started on the question. Part of our session today, as a reminder to the reporters, go ahead and put your name and your affiliation into the Q&A box that's separate from the chat, and let us know you either want to make your li mic live to ask live question or type your question and we'll read it to the audience. First question is coming from Jenny Shushek, a freelance science writer. Have the studies indicating seven gigatons per year been carried out long-term or just over a year or two? And if so, how long? Okay, I think that one's probably coming to me because that's a number that was uh, in my talk. Um, so for compost, there's only been uh, two well-documented long-term studies, uh, one for 19 years, one for about a, de a decade. And those both showed uh, long-term carbon storage and increased carbon storage over time. But this is likely not to be a one and done kind of activity. I think that uh, soil amendments, one of the things we're learning about is how frequently do we need to reapply these soil amendments. And our computer models have really focused on single amendments or decadal scale amendments. And the computer models suggest that, yeah, you can keep this going. Uh, but uh, time's going to tell whether or not those computer models are, are how accurate they are. Uh, but so far, at least for the first de first two decades, uh, we have some preliminary pro uh, promising results. Thanks, Wendy. We have a couple of additional panelists that are joining us for this Q and A session. Um, can I ask those two panelists to go ahead and unmic and introduce themselves? Hi, this is Blake Simmons. I'm a division director of biological systems and engineering at uh, Berkeley Lab, and a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Matt Dodds. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at UC Berkeley. My research is concerned with the development of materials for direct air capture. Thank you. All right, our next question is coming from reporter Richard Lovett. Can you talk a bit more about biochar? What are the costs and benefits in terms of life cycle of that material? What is the source of it? Some of the carbon would wind up in the air, I think, from the charring process. Um, I think that's probably me again. And so I'll, and others, other panelists should feel free to weigh in on this, but um, there's definitely some, uh, you know, no, none of these are carbon perfect. Um, approaches, especially anything that involves natural materials and working lands. Uh, but there's definitely likely to be a net carbon sink from biochar. Um, and, and there's folks working, I know, at Livermore National Lab to come up with ways of making biochar that could produce fuel and potentially could be carbon negative. 
So I, I think that there's a lot of, again, a lot of promise in this area, but I don't know if you remember from my slides that there's a significant amount of error around that number, that mean number. And again, you know, we're, we're pretty early into these technologies, um, so we're still learning. Uh, but in overall, the, the potential, again, is, is significant, should be part of our portfolio, but we should continue to learn more about it as we go forward. And Wendy, if I could just add there real quick, there, there are there are a host of technologies that can produce biochar, from torrefaction to gasification to pyrolysis. All of them have different emission profiles. All of them have different relative efficiencies in getting into biochar. And the and the nature of the biochar that they produce is also dependent on the feedstock that they put in, and the process conditions that they use. And so, um, there is a a, a biochar institute. Uh, that is comparing physical properties and looking at life cycle analysis associated with them. And there are multiple research groups looking at how to combine biochar with concrete and polymers and additives to, to put it into a form that is not only, you know, the typical soil amendment application, but also into net negative building materials that could go into a net negative carbon economy that would uh, also dovetail nicely with the recently announced infrastructure bill. So there's a whole there's a whole gamut of opportunities out there for this material, and something that um, is really important aspect to a carbon negative economy. I can also just add briefly that it really matters where you do biochar. The context of the local geography matters a lot, and you get very different carbon outcomes where you are. So I think it just really begs the question of how does any local community utilize the biomass that is available to them in the most optimal way, of which carbon storage can be one of them, but it's never going to be the primary use. So I think there's a lot of different factors and we should never think about just how do you maximize biochar carbon sequestration, but think in a much more systems level view about how do you manage that biomass whether it's the biochar or some sort of energy producing or even material producing process, all those options have pros and cons. Next question is coming from Gabriel Popkin, freelancer. For direct air capture, cost has obviously been a major constraint. Are new materials emerging that could start to bring the cost substantially down from the current? $600 per ton toward $100 per ton target? If so, could you talk a bit about some of these materials and how close they are to commercialization? I can answer this one. Um, so a lot of the research that we're doing here at the Berkeley Lab is interested in this exact question of trying to reduce the cost of direct air capture. So $600 for metric ton, that is currently where this company Climeworks is at with its, you know, the first commercial scale director capture facility. Um, but there is reason to believe that as experience is gained and as new materials are developed, we can approach $100 for metric ton. Um, it's important to recognize in this context that when you have an emerging material, you know, you have to put it through a series of iterations. This is a process known as technological learning. The first stages of making a technology um, in practice, you have to there are aspects that can be reduced in terms of cost. Um, and the work that we're doing is actually being commercialized. Um, the materials that I focus on in my PhD research are um, being manufactured at scale by a company called Mosaic Materials, um, which is located out here in California. So we hope that the cost can be brought down to somewhere in that neighborhood accordingly. Matthew, this is Bill. I'm, I'm wondering if, if um, you could also mention why where that $600 comes from. Uh, my understanding is that it's mostly from the energy input that's required to separate the CO2 from the material that absorbs the CO2 out of the Earth's atmosphere. And so there's you, you're, you and your colleagues are also pursuing some very clever techniques to bring down that energy input considerably. Yes, that's right. So um, currently, so the Hinwell plant from Climeworks requires <clears throat> 5.76 gig gigajoules of um, energy for every ton of CO2 capture. So that's that's a considerable amount of energy. And it's um, definitely, that's a critical cost component of the overall cost of direct air capture. So, um, it, you know, when you're designing materials, you wanna think about efficiency as well as capacity. And that's something that these materials that we're working on at Berkeley are able to achieve um, kind of in the same fell swoop. Uh, 
So you want to minimize the amount of energy needed to regenerate the material while also maximizing the capacity. The reason why you care about the capacity is that you don't need as much material, you know, to capture a set amount of CO2. And I, I, if I could just add on to what Matthew's talking about on the materials side, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that biology is a great direct air capture system as well. And Berkeley Lab is working on a lot of systems, be it ecosystem, land management, or direct biological system engineering uh, to enhance uh, CO2 capture from the atmosphere uh, in uh, emulating what nature's already provided us and then putting it on steroids to enhance the carbon sink applications of it. Um, and so just to, to, to say that, that it's going to take a portfolio of solutions, it's not going to be one silver bullet. I, I'm just hoping for a silver shotgun. Uh, and, and hopefully we can, we can develop a, a whole variety of tools and technologies that can help address this, uh, solu this problem in a full spectrum response. So just to add on to that, that pile right there. Next question is from Craig Bettenhausen from Chemical and Engineering News. Direct air capture is the most attractive where carbon-free power is available. Are direct air capture people talking with small nuclear reactor people or other next-gen nuclear developers? Similarly, how compatible is direct air capture technology with concentrated solar as a heat source? I think I could probably say a bit on that. Um, the Department of Energy is definitely interested in the combining these uh, and, and, and in this question. Uh, there's currently, I believe it's a funding opportunity out there where direct air capture systems are um, particularly um, to be looked at in the context of these uh, carbon-free energy sources. Can they be paired with, with nuclear? Can they be paired with geothermal waste heat? Can they be paired with solar thermal perhaps? Because that waste heat would be, um, would be helpful in a process of, of direct air capture. Of course, direct air capture people have to talk to other, uh, other entities as well. For example, the CO2 has to be placed somewhere. And that goes back to either some of the CO2 to products discussions or maybe the geological storage that I talked about earlier. It's also just a question of timing too. It's very hard to build an advanced nuclear project and it's very hard to build a direct air capture project if you do those two things in isolation. Trying to do them at the same time well introduces novel risks. So it might be something that we see be the normal development in the 2030s, but maybe not for the next handful of years. Yeah, I think, Noah, the, the low hanging fruits are probably the existing uh, geothermal plants or power plants or solar plants that you would co-locate your direct air capture systems with in a smart way. Yeah, so actually the Climeworks in um, its new plant in Iceland is operated by um, geothermal. So they're, they're interested in renewables and that's, that's a really promising strategy using low carbon energy sources so that you can minimize the overall carbon footprint of the process and actually make it as net negative as possible. Just to add on that, that CarbFix2 project is coupling direct air capture with geothermal and also leveraging the geothermal with basalt rocks to do CO2 mineralization for the storage site as well. Question from reporter Richard Levitt. How do you transport carbon dioxide in large quantities over significant distances? Yeah, the, the short answer is pipeline. The infrastructure bill actually has um, quite a bit of um, budget in uh, new pipeline capacities. And so the ideas then would be probably to, to pool from different sources, pipeline it, and then pipeline it to where it can be either sequestered, used, or stored. And this is a pretty standard practice. There are existing CO2 pipelines um, throughout uh, the much of the United States, in fact. Any further questions from our reporters in the audience? Looks like we've reached the end of our question queue. Thanks so much to our panelists today. And thank you to our reporters for their great questions. I'm going to pass the mic back over to my colleague, Becca, for final closing comments.
Yeah, thanks again to the panelists for sharing all that super interesting work um, and for the reporters as well for attending this session. Um, our next event today is a media roundtable from Johns Hopkins on a proposed interstellar probe, and that will begin at 3 p.m. Central Time. So thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you at a future press event as well. Thanks.